Uh, this is Stephen Sloan. The date is May 17, 2011. I'm with Dr. Robert Anderson uh, in his home, 4020 16th Street in Lubbock, Texas. I'm here with uh, Robert DeBoer. We're doing this interview with the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission's uh, Texas Liberators uh, Project. Thank you, Dr. Anderson, okay. for sitting down with me today. Well, let's go. Let's begin. Let's go back to Chicago. <laughs> Let, let's start in Chicago and tell me a little bit uh, about your family and some of those early memories in Chicago. Well, uh, let's see. The best I can say is that both of us have come from Swedish families, and uh, I lived. And in my early life, I was very closely associated with a, a Swedish church. Uh, the, the denomination is the Covenant, Evangelical Covenant, and at that time it was Swedish. So my early early years were centered on on Sweden, really. I mean, the, you know, the, our all my grandparents came from Sweden, and and my parents uh, spoke Swedish and so on. But unfortunately, they didn't speak Swedish to us. Uh. So, uh, and I lived uh, in the south side of Chicago, and went to elementary school and high school, uh, Calumet High School in Chicago, and. When I was about 11, my father passed away, and then uh, later my mother passed away, and I lived with my sister. I will, do want to say that Iris and I met uh, when we were about 15 or 16 at a church Bible camp, because she also comes from Chicago in an ethnic community, very much more so uh, uh, than myself, actually at North Park University. And I'd always wanted to go to school, and since uh, in the late, uh, early 40s and so on, there wasn't much money. Uh, when I graduated from high school, I started at Illinois Institute of Technology, which is the old Armour Engineering School. Uh, and I started in a co-op program. In other words, we went to school one semester and then worked a semester and so on. And I was in that program and I started in 42. Mm -hmm. At the time I was, I think, 18 and a half or something like that. And uh, while there, of course, the war was going on and many of us enlisted in the Army or Air Force or all four services at that time, so I wasn't drafted. And we uh, anticipated going to school, at least I was in the Air Corps, and anticipated going to school for a degree. But in March 1943, they called us all up, and <laughs> that was it after about a year of school. I want to go back and ask you, and I forgot to mention that Iris Anderson is with us. She's watching. You can't see her on the camera, but she's <laughs> watching. And she too. Um, I want to ask you a couple of questions about some things you've already mentioned. Um, in particular, kind of the Swedish upbringing, you talked about that being very much a part of your early life. Right. What, what did that look like? I know you said language that didn't necessarily pass down, but what did that look like as far as I guess holidays and food and all those sorts of things. Well, the food was very Swedish, although we did find in our numerous trips to Sweden later on that uh, the, the folks that uh, I lived with, all the, all the Swedish folks, they, they cooked as of 1900. <laughs> it wasn't contemporary Swedish cooking. <laughs> And uh, we always had the Swedish holidays, uh, and at church, I think this is the correct word, uh, we went to Yuleta, 
which is the uh, service at uh, Christmas Eve. And my father was an organist in the church. And I didn't know anybody else but Swedes. Uh, although I lived in a, I hesitate to say it this way, but an, another broader ethnic community that was uh, uh, Roman Catholic. And uh, so I was an <laughs> actually, actually minority. <laughs> Whereas I was lived in a Swedish community in Chicago. And we, I suppose this might be of some interest, uh, we had uh, Irish Mafia uh, bootleggers in our, our neighborhood, uh, very close to us. And I always like to tell the story that I remember as a kid, when I was very young, Al Capone coming down the alley with his machine gun shooting up our neighbors. <laughs> and. Uh, so I, I never went out with my daddy and shot rabbits. <laughs> we had the Chicago Mafia uh, trying to knock off the neighbors, which uh, they uh, were succeeding in doing to a certain extent. And I can imagine that was a that would be a memory that would stay with you. Well, it, it's a memory. Yeah. The. Uh, the leader of the, of the family uh, that were, were involved was Spike O'Donnell, and he's, you can find him in the, uh, on the internet, on the web. He's got a, there's yeah, interesting histories about him. So that was my early time, and... Uh, but I guess in that neighborhood, the Swedes were more kind of caught in the middle. They weren't necessarily involved no. in South Chicago. No, they were not involved at all. Now, what did your father do as an occupation? My father was very fortunate. Uh, he was a uh, salesman, and he was not tremendously affected by the uh, Depression, although all our, all our friends were. Mm -hmm. And he traveled quite a bit in Indiana and Michigan, Illinois, but he died in 19... 36. So from then on, uh, things changed quite a bit. Yeah. But the family weathered the early part of the Depression yeah. fairly well. Yeah. And my brother, my brother, older brother, passed away about three months before my father. So. What a tough period. <laughs> it's gone. Um, was your sister older that you, you went to live with your sister? Yes, my sister was, uh, let's see, she was born in 1913, so she was nine years older than me. Mm. And she had been married, but subsequently divorced. Mm. And, uh, but I was very close to her. Mm. Well, she, in other words, until I went to the army, she basically took care of me. Yeah. Well, um, we, uh, what were you studying, or you know, I know later where you ended up as far as your intellectual pursuits, but what were you interested in as a kid, the sorts of things that... Well, I went into uh, IIT, uh, and generally it was a business, so my first positions as a co-op student was uh, in accounting but I was not a great accountant. And it was during that first year and a half at IIT that I had my introduction to psychology. I see. And uh, then after the war, I decided to go, go that route. Mm -hmm. Which, um, your, what was your exposure to psychology during that early period? Well, I took a course. Okay. And a very dramatic old professor, and uh, who I subsequently went back to after the war, but uh, it had a, quite an impact on me. It was something I did did well at, 
Uh, do you remember what it was about at that age about psychology that uh, stimulated kind of your interest? No, it was more just a, a general course, you know, the basic, the basic course. I see. And uh, my mother had been very, very ill, uh, and I was associated or had a lot of experience in hospitals and mm -hmm. so on. Yeah. 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 Well, um, let's go forward a bit. You talked about the decision to enlist, and uh, you didn't have to enlist, so can you tell me a little bit about what you remember the reasons behind uh, deciding to enlist? Well, the recruiters came to the university. <laughs> And they encouraged us to enlist, and everybody did. I mean, you know, if you weren't in the, weren't being drafted, I was 18 or 18, and if you weren't drafted, why, you weren't, you weren't so good. So we had a choice of, you know, Coast Guard or Marines or Navy or Air Force or Army, you could enlist. and. Uh, we did that, as I said, with the idea in mind that you would complete your education. People in the, in the Navy programs, they generally completed their programs. But the people in the uh, Army and the Air Force were pulled out and sent uh, to various camps. So I, it was March 1943, and I went through the, the normal routine, you know, and wound up in St. Petersburg, Florida for basic training in the Air Force. And we had a real rough time. I lived in a hotel that they had taken over as a barracks. But it went through all the, the preliminaries, you know, the mar marching and all that uh, stuff. And then uh, following that, I was assigned to uh, training as a radar operator. And, and I spent time uh, doing some instructing and so on in radar, which was new at the time, and had quite a bit of experience around Bradenton, Sarasota, Florida, and that area, which was very primitive then. And then this business about the ASTP came up. Are you familiar with that? Yes. The Army Specialized Training Program. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so I applied for that, and I was accepted. And my induction of that was at uh, Deland College. And uh, I, think, I can't remember. It was near Sanford, Florida, and near Orlando that area, and from there I was sent up to the University of Georgia in Athens. And this was in engineering. And the idea was that we were to go on and finish our uh, degree programs. But as you probably know, and there's a lot of information about the ASDP, uh, there are some 250,000 young men who are in the ASDP programs all over the nation. I don't know if Baylor had one. I know the University of Texas, El Paso, uh, Texas Tech. I don't think Texas Tech did have a program at that time. But we were spread out all over. My neighbor, I think, was at the University of Washington or Washington State. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, they say I went in ASDP around February, started the University of Georgia at Athens. In March of 1944, uh, General Marshall decided, have you heard this story before? No, no please. You, 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 yeah. <laughs> we need to have it recorded here. Oh, <laughs> in March of 1944, they decided that the ASDP program was expendable and they needed troops to fill out the divisions that were going to 
Europe for the big invasion. Yes. And so they canceled the 200, the programs all over the nation. And all of us were put into various divisions. The only ones who were not uh, put into the, uh, taken out of the program were the people in the medical schools. Mm -hmm. So you'll find a few physicians around, but we have one of them living here, who went through medical school uh, in the ASDP program. And of course they never, they weren't through till after the war. Well, do you remember the moment you heard the program was canceled and you were being... Oh boy, we didn't know what was going to happen. I mean, they put us on a bus and uh, we went down to the 10th Armored Division. And 800 of us went into the 10th Armored as privates. And of course, the 10th Armored uh, was an established division. It formed in 1942. So it was, I mean, they had the, the uh, officers and the enlisted people, the uh, non-commissioned officers and so on. And we were just, we just filled in. And I was fortunate since I was, uh, had been in radar, I was put into the signal company, the 150th signal company. But many of my friends either went to be tankers or infantry and so on. Mm -hmm. And probably wouldn't be here if it had been that way. Uh, and so we went in in March of 44. And by September, the division was sent overseas. Yeah, well, by that point, you knew what you were training for. You knew. What was next? I mean, you knew you were probably going to Europe. We just knew we were going to, to uh, Camp Shanks in, yeah. uh, in, in New York. We didn't know where we were going. Yeah, where you were going from but we, were, we assumed as an armor division we were probably going to Europe. Yeah. Well, uh, I wanted to ask, as you were talking about it earlier, what did you think of Army life? Well, I think uh, I'm not a soldier. Well, I, I, I adapted. I did what I had to do, but uh, it wasn't my thing. And you just, you just did what you had to do. Yeah. And uh, there was no real love for it and so on, although a great deal of loyalty developed. Uh, as you can see here from the, uh, that I told you about my activities with the Medicines Association. Mm -hmm. So we went to Europe, and uh, I want to mention one more thing about ASDP. A number of us who were in ASDP, at least from the 10th Armored, and I'm sure Dr. Hartman will tell you from the 11th Armored, uh, after the war we were involved in the Veterans Association, and as the years have gone on, the leaders of those groups like the Western Association, became the leaders of the Vets Association. So I have been the, the president of the 10th uh, Armored uh, <laughs> Association. And, but we've all come up to leadership positions because we were all very well educated. Mm -hmm. Most of us continued on with our education in various forms, mm -hmm. either completing uh, a bachelor's degree or going on for doctorates and various levels like that. Interesting. Well, it, it is uh, because uh, here I was a buck private, you know, at the bottom of the hierarchy, and uh, now I'm, I have become a leader in the group. And I think it's very interesting. Uh, had you traveled much in your younger years? I know. I know. Later on in your li in life, you traveled quite a bit, yeah. but. Had you traveled much in your younger years? Prior to the Army? Yeah. Uh, oh, no. We spent a lot of time in Michigan, but no. Well, what, I mean, th this is all a lot to take in. Not only Army life, but 
going overseas and well going to the south first of all I probably had to have a little bit of culture shock <laughs> <laughs> well I'll tell you if you're from Mississippi or I lived there an experience when I was at the University of Georgia in Athens uh, I had a girlfriend and her, her father was a uh, professor at, at the University of Georgia and they invited me over for Sunday dinner and which you know you don't turn that down so I went there and, and it was a very formal southern uh, family and at the Sunday dinner they served some stuff in white stuff in a bowl and they passed it to me and I looked at it and I couldn't figure out what the heck it was it was hominy and I didn't know how to eat it, and uh, it, it just was, you know, it was a shock, and that was, that was, the, but instead of the potatoes, it was, it was a hominy. Yeah. <laughs> that was my first experience, really, of the <laughs> Southern culture. Yes. And if they had doubts about you before, they probably had more doubts. Pardon? If the family had doubts about you before, they probably had more doubts after your dinner. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, let, let's go up to uh, shipping out um, from New York. Can you, can you talk about that uh, process? Just uh, We went to Camp Shanks. That was uh, in New Jersey. I New think. Jersey. In the, yeah. And we were put on ships. We, I was... Uh, put on one of the old Liberty ships. Uh, these were the old seven knot freighters and another part of the division was put on a, a passenger ship which promptly run aground uh, as we headed out. And so we joined a convoy uh, going across to Europe. I think it took 14 days. It could, they could only go as fast as the slowest ship. We were on the slowest ship. I don't know how many of us were on the, on the ship, but it, you know, the bunks were stacked up three and four, five high, and so on. I think the one memorable experience I had on that is that uh, it became very rough in the mid-Atlantic, very rough. And the old ship was very light because it all it had on it was, was the soldiers. And so the stern would come up and that old propeller would, you know, she'd come out of the water. And, but they wanted to keep us busy. So they decided that one of the things that would keep us busy was to do guard duty. Because we could never tell, you know, who might try to climb on that boat. I think this recorder has stopped for some reason. Oh, let me, you want to stop that? All right, you were telling me about being assigned to guard duty. Being assigned to guard duty. So we each had to spend a few hours with our rifles guarding. And my assignment in the middle of the night during the biggest storm they had on the Atlantic was at the stern of the ship. That's you know, that's the back of the ship. Mm -hmm. And I was to guard against any Germans climbing up <laughs> onto that ship. And I stood out there for, for a couple hours, you know, with the rudder coming out of the, uh, out of the water. And uh, that wasn't a very pleasant experience. <laughs> and made me decide maybe I was wise and not going into the Navy. But it, uh, I was very one of the fortunate ones that I didn't get sick. But a good number of the men were sick, mm -hmm. and so we finally got over to to uh, Europe or calmer waters. And my division was the first division to land directly in France, and we landed at Cherbourg, and Cherbourg had just. Let's see, that was in late September and so on. And of course, uh, they, the uh, 
uh, invasion was in, in June, so they had just cleared out that whole Normandy area. So we, we came in at Cherbourg and uh, did our staging, what they call staging, in other words, getting ready in Normandy. So my first experience in, uh, in Europe was in Normandy with the hedgerows and so on, living in pup tents and uh, with a lot of rain. What, what was some of your initial impressions of the situation there when you got there in September? People were poor. I mean, I had never seen that kind of, they were, it was farm, farmland. I had never seen a house where the people lived in, in one side and the cows lived in the other side. And, uh, you know, it was, it was really very rural. And uh, I had never heard of the, uh, the various liquors that they had. Of course, soldiers always go for the liquor and try to buy that. Uh, I'm sure every uh, army in the world, the first thing that soldiers hid for is where is the booze. But there was none available. So it was, it was very rural and uh, the hedgerows were so different, you know, and, and we did our, our jobs and getting it ready to go into uh, combat, which we had no idea at my level, no idea of what was going to happen. Well, what was the mood, what was the conversation like, you remember, among the men? What was it like? Yeah, I mean... God, I wish this rain had quit. No, I'm, at, at the level I was, I mean, that's, uh, you know, that's where you were. Uh, and then you had your various assignments to your units, but we had no idea of what we were getting into, absolutely none. Now, you were, uh, you were in the Signal Corps. I was in a Signal Company. Signal Company. Yeah. Uh, but you were doing wire? Oh, I was yeah. a wireman, yeah. Yeah, you were a wireman. You had to climb telephone poles and lay the, lay the wire. And at that point, we had two vehicles in our unit, not in the signal company, but in our unit. One was a half track, and the other was a jeep. Uh, they, in an armored division, they didn't call them jeeps, they called them peeps. So we had those two vehicles and they had reels of wire on them, you know, and they had the climbers and all that sort of stuff. So, and, and the telephone switchboard, that, mm. I don't think we carried one, but we did have. So that's, uh, that's what we were learning how to do. And of course, a guy like myself hadn't been very well trained because we hadn't been with the division before. So we came in as, Pretty raw, pretty mm -hmm. raw. Mm -hmm. Well, I, not much in your radar operator training was helping you. No, nothing. Yeah. nothing. Uh, so the, the staging area there, you're doing training and getting ready to begin your advance out of Sherbrooke. Correct. Uh, well, that's in, uh, you said in September. Well, it was, it took us. Yeah, because we went, I think it was, I think it would be in the book there, but we left there in either late October or early November, I don't know the date, and headed out across France to the, uh, to the quote, front, front lines, mm -hmm. which was at that time around Metz uh, in Alsace-Lorraine region. So we went through Paris. I went, my first experience in Paris is riding down the Champs de say, in a half track, and under the Arc de Triomphe, and on the way. You know, this is not a, a uh, I suppose, a appropriate memory, but in riding in the half track, they didn't stop for anything. And I just had to go to the 
restroom. Of course, there was none available. So all I could do was hang out the back of that track going down the middle of Paris. <laughs> That's a very appropriate memory, and I guarantee it's not in that book. <laughs> so, I need to, that's your first introduction to Paris. Well, I was about to uh, ask if you had any interactions with Parisians while you were there. No, uh, not, not, not Parisians. Yeah, but in the countryside, did you have much interactions with the Parisians? Not as we were going through, Yeah, because we were, we were moving, mm -hmm. and, and uh, so we would just stop for the night. And of course, all of these er this area was very secure. Yeah, it was all yeah. secure. Yeah. Yeah. And so we went to in France all the way up to Metz, which is uh, close to the, what is it, the Saar River, Moselle, in that area. And that's the Maginot Line, really. And so our first combat experience was trying to penetrate the maximum line with the tanks and so on. Uh, can, can you walk me through that experience? Just, you know, you're a soldier, but that first experience where you realize, okay, this is real and we're at war. Yeah, it, it was yeah. not for, for us and the uh, single company. What we would do is run wire from the either division headquarters to Combat Command B, which is equivalent to a res uh, regiment, or from Combat Command B up to battalion. So this was more or less of a stable front, and there were four A's trying to go through that Maginot line, but we did not, uh, oh, I heard a lot of, of uh, artillery, but it was not in intense combat at all. And the first real combat uh, that I experienced was we went up to a town called Thionville, which is on the Moselle, close to Luxembourg. Mm -hmm. And at that point, we uh, went through Thionville, and parts of the division were the first army division, or into Germany, and it was a border. And I suppose another experience that I had in Theonville or outside Theonville, which is a very lasting, uncomfortable memory, is that uh, as th we didn't have a lot of heavy clothing. We were getting it gradually, but we had, as a wireman, you had to go out and you work with your hands, so you had gloves. And I lost a glove, and there was no, no other glove, so I was without a glove. So we were parked on a road in the convoy, and I looked over there, and there was a whole pile of soldiers, dead soldiers. They just lined them up on the road, uh, you know, they, and then they were waiting for the mortuary trucks to come and pick them up, but they were mostly German soldiers. There was one American who was from our division that night before had been killed. So I went through those looking for gloves. Mm -hmm. I found a glove. Mm -hmm. And, excuse me, I took it from a young German soldier and on his belt he had God is with us. God mit uns. I'm sorry. I've had a post traumatic stress syndrome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Some of this really gets. 65 years of life. I'll be okay in a minute. No, you don't apologize and please take your time. But my thought was, Jesus, I've been praying to God all my life. 
And here's my enemy with the same thing. It yeah. didn't make sense. It didn't make any sense. Sense at all. I thought I had this under control, but it still comes back. Well, you know, to have that sort of intimate encounter with the enemy and identify that had to be a very powerful moment for you. Yeah, it was. Yeah. You know, what the hell are we doing here? Yeah. So, we, we went through Theonville, and in that area, Merck's area, and if you want, you can read it in the book. Uh, and this was in December, early December, around December 13th, 14th. And that's when the Germans broke through on the bulge. Mm -hmm. Now, we were just south of Luxembourg. And the Germans had broke through, and the southern end of their line was in Luxembourg. Mm -hmm. You probably have heard this so before. It was, so it was right above you. You right were right, above right below the bulge. Yeah. And so General Patton, in all his wisdom, said, we've got to stop the Germans, 10th Armored Division. So the 10th, on the 16th of December, was sent up to, uh, to uh, Luxembourg. And I remember the first night in the Luxembourg billet, and the division was split up. Part of it went to the, uh, to the front in Luxembourg and the rest of us in CCB. were sent to a town called Bat. Bastogne. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. But we were sent to Bastogne. And our division was the uh, first troops to stop the Germans. I'll show you what happened here. Maybe I'll get myself together here a little bit. I haven't done this in a long time. And we were the, the wire platoon that's attached to CCB, so we were the only wire, wire group to half track and, and jeep. This is the map? That's the map. I see. And as you can see, the whole German army was coming down. Yeah. And our, our tankers, and infantry stop the uh, you want me to wait? No, no, you're fine. Anyway, we were there about 18 hours before the 101st Airborne Division. And if we hadn't been there, they would have, Germans would have come right through. That's right. Uh, but. And they would, if the 101st hadn't gotten there, uh, well, we would have been eliminated. And as you probably know from history, the town was surrounded. And we did our duty. We laid our wire. And uh, it was, that's what this comes from. So, starting with the 18th of December, 
until early January when I was evacuated. Why? Yeah, we were there, and it was. Uh, but you didn't think about the. I wrote a little book about this. You didn't think about, you know, you're going to die, because if you did, you were gone. You just did what you had to do. Well, maybe I had to have a little scotch. <laughs> yeah, we know that's why. My wife has been through this. And so, we, I don't know what to tell you about Bastogne, except that it was a, a pretty rough experience. Well, I know in that period, it's, it's every moment, right? It's, it's, Pardon? There's no, there's no relief from it. There's it's, no relief. It's constant. Yeah, we were, we were surrounded for about five or six days. And I remember when the, six days, I remember when the airdrop came in and C-47s dropped supplies to us and we were down to basic rations and no ammunition and our track had been blown up and it was just, but we had, I remember when McCullough said nuts, you know, with the German surrender uh, demand, but again at my level we had no idea how bad it was. I had no idea. And of course this has been glorified in the movie with Patton and the Battle of the Bulge and all this sort of stuff. And the latest one is, uh, I'd see that one with, what is it, Tom Cruise or Tom Hanks and the oh, uh, brothers. Uh, Band of Brothers. Man, Band of Brothers. Band of Brothers, yeah. And, uh, but they never mentioned the 10th Armored, uh, our division because we were there right with them the whole time. But, uh, you know, it was, it was a glorified uh, thing. And now, it wasn't fun then. So, in mid-January, sometime around there, I wasn't feeling too well. I went to the aid station and my eyes were yellow, so I had hepatitis. <laughs> which is probably from the unsanitary conditions. And I was evacuated at that time. Went back through hospitals in Paris and Le Mans, France. And uh, was sent up, back up to my division and, and joined the division in Trier. And our, our division had just taken Trier at that point. Uh, and that's when I, that was in probably in early March. Uh, and from that point on I was with the division till the end of the war. Of course the situation in March, Well, the world of difference than January. Yeah, well, but yeah. Trier was, uh, had just taken, that's quite a, you know, it was an old Roman town and, and so on. And I remembered when I got there and joined the, the group again, why uh, the, uh, they had just broken into some champagne factory. So I drank champagne out of a tin, <laughs> a tin cup. <laughs> but we went, uh, from there we went through, they just broke through, went through Kaiserlautern, up to the Rhine River and that was, there would be pockets of German resistance but we were moving quite rapidly. Mm -hmm. So we came to the Rhine River around uh, Mannheim, Ludwigshafen. Are you familiar with this geography? Mm -hmm. That's on the Rhine and went across there and the first city that we stayed in for a couple of days was Heidelberg. Uh, and at this point we had moved into the 7th Army from the 3rd Army because we were going south. And uh, so I had my first experience in Heidelberg 
in, uh, at that time. I was there for a couple of days because we didn't stay too long. And then the division continued on south. And they, you know, we just just moved. Yeah. Tremendous differences, and we had pockets of resistance and so on. And we were just doing our duty, laying wire and keeping up with them. So were there, uh, did lines of communication stay pretty well open at that point? Uh, not the German lines. The, no, I mean the uh, yeah, Allied lines. Yeah, we were able to keep them open. Mm -hmm. And we had radio and so on. But they were moving awfully fast. And uh, they had a great deal of difficulty around Krailsheim. Uh, but I was not involved in that. I suppose another experience. Uh, I went to a, we went to a town, and stayed a couple of days, and I can't remember the name of it. I think it was Origin, but there was a uh, old German uh, castle there or palace that we we stayed in actually. And it was an old German, uh, I forget the name, Lohengrin. It, it's very similar to the name of uh, Queen Elizabeth's husband's family. He was know, from Germany. And I remember being in the garden of that place, and this very elderly gentleman came out and uh, you know, there was no resistance. And the servants came up to him and backed away from him. You know, it was real royal sort of behavior. Mm -hmm. And it was such a contrast to the, uh, to, uh, you know, the supposed Nazi uh, regime and so on and the, and the military aspect of Germany mm -hmm. to see this, this really old world stuff. Mm -hmm. So I managed to liberate, I think, a little suitcase and a fountain pen. <laughs> that was, you never stole anything, you just liberated. Liberated. Uh, there was a lot of things liberated. Yeah, a lot of things were liberated. Yeah. <laughs> and so we continued on south. And uh, you want me to get into this camp? <laughs> Uh, yeah, if you could, if you'll begin by talking about, you know, any, anything you had heard of, of places like this or... We heard nothing. Yeah. And now at my level, we heard nothing, absolutely nothing. We didn't know what we were getting into. We just knew that we were going south. We knew we crossed the Danube River, Ulm, and, uh, you know, I hardly knew Blue Danube walls, but... Uh, we were just just going south, and we knew we were <coughs> in Bavaria, and we knew that I guess one of the things that really hit us, hit me, was the contrast between France and Germany. Mm. France and the Alsace region was poor. I mean, it was you know very rural. As soon as you went into Germany, it was clean. It was just like home. And uh, nobody was a Nazi. We, we, we always built it to, you know, when you come into a town and you say, Raus, get out, and we would take over their, their home. It didn't make any difference, you know, they, wherever the heck they went. But we, we, didn't, uh, we didn't have to sleep in pub tents. And, uh, but it was such a contrast between people who were very clean and spotless and so on, uh, and the, the French who were very rural and, uh, at, you know, close to poverty level. Mm -hmm. I remember that very clearly. Mm -hmm. So on we went. Mm -hmm. Well, um, yeah, let, let's talk a little bit about um, Oh, what, one thing that, were you taking on prisoners at Pit, prisoners of war, that lot of... They were taking, we were taking, you see, the, and yeah. in the book you'll see that uh, 
we were taking out tremendous numbers of prisoners, yeah. and they were, and they were young, young kids, many of them. Uh, but we liberated thousands of, not liberated, but took thousands of prisoners, and you'd see them marching down the road, you know being guarded and so on. I had no contact with them at that point. Mm -hmm. Well, let's uh, move into um, the, uh, when you're getting into uh, the Landsberg area, or uh, is it Middle, Middlebaum? Mid Middlebaum? I'm no, Mid no, I'm Middingen. Middingen, okay. When you get into the Middingen area and you begin to hear of uh, the camps. Didn't hear them. We just went into the camp. I okay. Mean, uh, my experience. I have to talk about my experience. Yes. Well, take. I want to go through your experience. Uh, my experience is all of a sudden here we are. We're in a camp. Okay. And uh, sleep in those those barracks that they have there. And don't talk to the soldiers. There's a lot of Americans here. You can see the picture. Don't talk to them. I remember that because there might be German spies. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm sure at the higher levels they were, they knew what the situation was. And that was my first experience at seeing men and people with the striped uniforms that you've seen in the pictures. So that the, the, well, the picture here is of American prisoners, but there were really a lot of uh, real concentration camp people. And the other thing that struck me was they were, they looked like Mongolians. Mm -hmm. And they must have been from Russia or something like that. But there was a lot of people that didn't look like Germans or didn't look like us Caucasians. Uh, they were obviously from a different ethnic group. Mm -hmm. And they were, they were wearing the striped uniforms and they were They were milling around and so on. But they didn't want us to have any contact with them. And, and see, this is the first day that we were in into this situation. Uh, you may not be familiar, or maybe you are, with with how you're fed. You're fed off the back of a truck, and they have three GI cans, and you dip your uh, throw your garbage in one, and you dip your your mess kit into another and you clean it and rinse it off over here. And what I remember is those guys in those uniforms standing by the garbage. Any sort of sustenance that they could get. Pardon? Any sort of sustenance that they could get. They were eating that garbage. Mm -hmm. And then we left. Now you were instructed for security concerns not to uh, interact that much. Yeah. So that was the yeah. concern. See, that was the first day, first and second day. Yeah. And uh, I just, I just remember. I can't tell you, verify this in any way. I just remember. Don't talk to them. Mm -hmm. Or don't talk to the Americans. Can you describe what the camp looked like, or what you remember? The camp looking like? Uh, well, I remember barracks buildings and very crude, crude barracks buildings and uh, bunks stacked three and four high. And uh, I can't remember much more. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, southern in Bavaria. Uh, I can't remember the mountains at that point. Uh, but it was, uh, we had driven through Meningen, I remember that, and that was a nice city, and they, there was no resistance. Well, I can imagine from how you describe, um, you know, them looking for any sort of food, uh, the appearance, you talked about the stripe, but I imagine the condition you notice of the but they weren't the American. Yeah. They weren't the prisoners of war. Yeah. Uh, you know, because they found there was about three or four guys from 
our division who had been captured during the Bastogne who were in the camp. And I never saw them, but apparently they identified themselves. Uh, and they were all still in their uniforms or, you know, their army clothes. Mm. But I never saw those guys too much. It was mostly the guys eating out of the garbage can. Mm. Uh, had it been a work camp? Do you know if it was a work camp? I think it was a work camp, yeah. yeah. It was not a death camp. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I'm sure people died right and left, but it was a, it was a work camp. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that uh, Dachau, I think it might have been a, uh, they call it a, a Stalag number, but it uh, probably was some offshoot of Dachau or something like that. Mm -hmm. My neighbor will tell you about that. Yeah, yeah. So did the uh, uh, prisoners who were in the camp stay around or did they leave while oh, you were there? there? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Y'all kept moving. Huh? We kept, kept we, moving. Kept, we, we kept going south. Yeah. So we uh, went south and my uh, unit, uh, CCB, went into Austria at the town of Fusen, F-U-S-S-E-N. And this was our first entry into uh, Austria. And within a day or so, or within a day, we were in the town of Garmisch-Partenkirchen. Garmisch-Partenkirchen was the center of the 19... 68 or right there, Olympics. And it was uh, in Austria uh, near the Zugspitz. Uh, the uh, Zug is trained in German. Uh, the mountains, you know. Mm. And at that point, this was around the 1st of May, that was it. So we occupied uh, Garmisch from that point up until September. Mm. Well, the, uh, you, you tell me your impressions of France and Germany, and you, what were your impressions of Austria? Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. As a matter of fact, uh, while I was there, uh, Zugspitz had uh, <clears throat> it was quite a tourist area, and there was a train that went up the mountain, and <clears throat> I remember taking the uh, the train and the, and the uh, cable car all the way up to the top to Schneefer House, the snow house, which is, I did my first skiing at over 10,000 feet uh, on the, uh, there, and we just, we used that area, and it was, a, it was a beautiful area. Subsequently, after the war, it became a recreational center for American troops, mm -hmm. but uh, it was, it was beautiful. Stayed in the, put us up in the Bahnhof Hotel, train station hotel. Uh, and from there we did our, our uh, job of laying wires, you know, getting communication going. Mm -hmm. And never found a Nazi. <laughs> well, um, where were you? when you heard of the surrender? Right in Garmisch. Yeah. And uh, do you remember how you responded when you heard? It was relief. It was relief. But all we could think about was, I suppose now we had to go to Japan. And that actually was the, that was the word, you're going to go go to the east, mm -hmm. and uh, there was no question about that. So, so we were, we were there for some time, and uh, I became sick in Garmisch, and again was sent back to a hospital uh, in France, Nancy, France, or Nancy, France, which is near Metz. Mm -hmm. And while there, I was looking through the roster at the Red Cross workers, and I saw his name, and I said, my God, 
is one of my sisters and one of our family's best girl, my sister's best girlfriend, who's in the Red Cross, <laughs> Lois Nelson. And uh, so I immediately had a contact in the hospital with Lois, and I became a sort of a volunteer for the Red Cross there. It was fun. And I went back and joined the division, and then uh, in September, uh, they had a point system, uh, you know, a number of years in service and so on. And then you went home, depending upon how many points you had. And I did not, since we came in, most of us came in late to the division, we did not go with the division to uh, leave in September to go back to the States. So I was assigned and sent to the 71st Division in Augsburg, Germany, which is a little bit north. And stayed there for some time, uh, doing nothing. And What did you do to pass the time? Nothing. <laughs> it was, oh, I think I did some work. Uh, in finance, but really nothing much. And then uh, we started the trick home, went to Antwerp, uh, and then we got to England. So, mm -hmm. And I arrived back in the States in mid-January, after a 10-day trip across the Atlantic again. Well, while I ask, I ask about uh, VE Day, where do you remember hearing the news of VJ Day? Uh, yeah, I think I was on a train coming back from the hospital. And in a 40 and 8 car. They used to put us in 40 and 8 cars. You know what a 40 and 8 I do not know what a 40 and 8 car is. <coughs> 40 men or 8 horses. No, uh, in other words, it was it was not a passenger car. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but that was the name, forty and eight. And uh, I remember that. And it was not. Uh, I don't think the impact really hit it, but we realized then we wouldn't be going to Japan. Well, I know you were anxious to get back home. Huh? Oh yeah, I was. You, we've already established you didn't want to be a career. Uh, I military. established. Oh, I had a girlfriend over there, and I, I thought gave it some thought, but fortunately, I, I uh, decided that wasn't the route to go. So I came back. I think I was discharged January sixteenth from uh, Camp Grant in Rockford, Illinois. Went. Uh, immediately went home to Chicago. And I think a week later, or something like that, I called Iris, because we had been the correspondent, and uh, went up to her house on the north side of Chicago. And Iris, can you describe that? Is she there? She's there. I mean, you tell her. Huh? <laughs> she wants you to tell her. Well, I remember going to her house, and it was uh, in this, again, the Swedish community. Uh, and I think we saw each other, and that was it. <laughs> Were you Swedish enough for them? Her father was an immigrant, uh -huh. and her mother had lived in Sweden, and, and she lived in a, it was really a very ethnic Swedish community. Yeah. Uh, with, uh, with North Park University, which is, uh, at that time, was very Swedish, yeah. uh, church-related school. And, uh, but it was, they had, we had known each other from church experiences when we were kids. So the church I went to and the church she went to were part of the same denomination. So we, we were very familiar with Although I have not familiar with her father's Swedish accent, so I... 
So were you married that spring? We were married that spring. When was it? Oh, May. May? Yeah. Uh-oh, you may have an anniversary coming up. You? May 25th, wasn't it, Iris? Yeah. You better remember that. And the Swedish church. <laughs> and at that point, uh, I had already started Illinois Tech. Okay. And uh, then I uh, transferred to the University of Chicago. I had about a year and a half or something like that. And my professor at uh, Dr. Boder at uh, Illinois Tech suggested I go to Chicago. Now, it was very interesting uh, about Boder. Boder was an old Latvian uh, immigrant from years back who had gone originally to uh, uh, Mexico and did some work down there as a psychologist and then came up to Chicago and became a professor at Illinois Tech. But he had a Jewish background. And after the war, or right after, he got the idea of doing oral histories with people who had been in concentration camps. Interesting. And so he took an old wire recorder and went over to, to Europe to interview uh, concentration camp survivors. And the interesting thing was that the uh, wire recorder at that time was patented and developed at the University of Chicago, mm -hmm. or rather at Illinois Tech. Oh, was it? <laughs> yeah, and I remember having a professor by the name of Hayakawa, who subsequently was a senator from California, brought that into class. This was before, uh, before the war and demonstrated it to us. But anyway, David went over to, to Europe and he re recorded all these interviews with people. He came back and he had all these wires. Now, you, you guys don't know what a wire recorder is, but if that wire becomes goofed up, I mean, you got problems. And it was just a very thin wire uh, and so he gave me a, a little job of helping him sort of straighten out those uh, those reels of wire because when he got over there he didn't realize there was a different current. You know, we have 110 and 220 over there, so there was a different speed uh, associated with those damn things didn't, <laughs> didn't uh, wind correctly. So we had all this data on wire that was almost impossible to, to regain. He subsequently has written a book about that, mm. by the way, those interviews. It's David Boder, B-O-D-E-R. I don't have a copy of the book, but he, he did publish it. And I'm sure through Amazon or uh, through your life, through the library. Uh, to, to the libraries, you can find that book, but it would be some of your best information about the experience of uh, the concentration camp to death camps. Were you able to save any of the recordings? No. no. But I don't know if he did. I just spent time with him in his home. And that's when he introduced me to classical music and, and so on. They were very, uh, very German. He had lived in Germany, in Austria. So it, it, that was a very interesting experience. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I went to the University of Chicago. And at the time I went, Iris, were you pregnant then? Yeah. Yes, I had to. <laughs> we didn't control things as well back then. <laughs> <laughs> you would have scheduled this differently if you had thought yeah. about it. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we were living on the north side, and I'd take the streetcar and the elevated train down to Chicago. And Iris helped me quite a bit. We had some contacts. Before you got into Chicago. Pardon? Before you got in, started the University of Chicago, you had that 
ruptured kid, uh, ruptured appendix. Oh yeah. I oh, went, your appendix ruptured. Uh, up in there, and I went to the Swedish hospital, and nowadays it would be nothing, but then it was quite a bit, and so uh, Iris had to go down to the university and, and register me, didn't you? I had to go down to the university at about eight and a half months pregnant <laughs> to register you at the university. And uh, fortunately, we had a friend down there that helped me. Help. Uh, our friend, one of our friends down there, was from the same Swedish community, and we had two friends. And uh, one of them was uh, at that time a, a adjunct professor or something like that. He subsequently became president of North Park University. But. Uh, so I started out in psychology, went into psychology at that point. And I suppose another relevant thing is that's when this darn post-traumatic thing really hit me. And uh, so I, I went over to the counseling center in Chicago and asked for some help. I didn't go to the BA. Probably my life would have been differently if I had gone to the VA, because a lot of soldiers did. So I started out in psychotherapy there. And that, at that time, in 1948, uh, a professor had come from the University of Ohio to Chicago to take over the counseling center. And he was probably, at that point, one of the outstanding psychologists in the United States. His name was Carl Rogers. And uh, he's pub published a tremendous amount. I don't know if you've ever heard of I've it. I've heard that man. Yeah. And I, he was director of the counseling center. He was not my therapist, but uh, I became influenced by that experience. And that's when I moved into clinical psychology. Well, I'd like to ask you a little bit about that because it, it is an unusual, uh, I just know my wife's a psychologist, as I said, and not a lot of psychologists, especially that do clinical work, have necessarily been in counseling themselves. So how did that, do you think that experience, how did it make you feel about psychology or going into psychology? Do you think that changed your career path? Well, it helped. I had about 300 hours of therapy, but I never had any medication or anything. Uh, I never, if I'd gone to the VA, it would have been different. Yeah. Uh, so I had, you know, my life was built around that. Uh, around that. Yeah. And I subsequently, oh, I had, uh, you see, Chicago at that time did not give a bachelor's degree. So I went on for the master's and then decided to go on for the PhD. And I worked with Rogers. Rogers was my dissertation advisor. So what was, I joked about it earlier, what, what was your PhD uh, research? Oh, it was, uh, it was a, a study of psychotherapy, yeah. physiological measurements during therapy. Mm -hmm. Is published, uh, and I worked on that, and became a oh they called him an extern, and I was hired by the uh, by the counseling center and to do things. And my last appointment was as a United States Public Health Fellow uh, in clinical psychology, and. But I continued working with these people. All, all I knew was working in a therapeutic environment. And Rogers was so different at that time. He was the, oh, probably the most controversial and the most well-known psychologist in the, in the nation, and actually in the world. Because uh, while, while at the counseling center, people used to come in from all over the world to study with him. And, our situation was so different than most graduate programs. The graduate students were involved in the decision-making processes. Mm -hmm. So I had contact with people, brought them over for dinner from uh, 
a priest from, uh, I remember one priest from, a Jesuit from Netherlands and people like this. And it was a, a eye-opening uh, experience, really. Mm. So different from our old ethnic, yeah. ethnic background. Yeah. And uh, so in 1952, two of my colleagues there, who I was very close to, the graduate students, uh, one, uh, one of my professors went to the University of Texas, uh, Carson McGuire brought in, and he brought in Bill Kell, who was a graduate student ahead of me. And then he brought in another guy who I was very, very close to called Ollie Bound, Oliver Bound, at the University of Texas. And they just they needed another psychologist at the counseling center there. <laughs> so they put the finger on me. So we got near old Hudson and came down to Texas in 1952. And that talk about culture shock. <laughs> that was culture shock. And you settled in the Swedish community and... <laughs> no, no, not exactly. Uh, we... Uh, oops, I'm sorry. Uh, so we started out there, and I didn't have my degree, I was ABT, mm -hmm. and that was 52. I finished up my dissertation in December of 54, and uh, when I had gone up to Chicago for my master's, I, I, I didn't walk for the PhD, which I regret very much because of that Rockefeller Chapel you know, mm -hmm. ceremony. And uh, so I had my PhD then. And in 19, this is 55, early 55, a position opened up at Tech, and I was recruited for it. And they paid more money. <laughs> I think it was a couple thousand dollars more a year. Huh? Virtually double your salary. Yeah, it was. So I came up to here in a dust store. Talk about culture shock. <laughs> my, my, my yeah, first, Austin was one thing, but Lubbock is oh, completely other. Oh, my first experience with Lubbock coming up for the job interview was I flew Braniff Airlines. No, it wasn't even, it was before Braniff in a DC-3 coming up here and it, it was a dust storm and that Airplane tried to land here at the airport about four times and couldn't make it through the dust storm. So they went up to Amarillo and landed up there and we took a taxi down to Lubbock. And that was my introduction to Lubbock, Texas. <laughs> so we decided to take the job with more money. I mean, you go where the buck is. <laughs> and uh, faculty positions were hard to come by at that point. Yeah. So we started out here. Was that was that because a lot of GIs were graduating with degrees? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it was a flooded job market. Excuse me, I'll turn it off for a minute. Sure. All right, now, now Iris reminded me of a story that you need to tell about <laughs> back at Bath Stone. Well, the we were laying wire in the town. You know, we would just go through and lay wire any place. He didn't worry about telephone poles, just put it over houses and everything. And the order went out uh, to the civilians that if you get caught cutting wire, you'd be shot. So, <laughs> uh, sergeant came down and he says, they caught an old boy clipping some wire over this doorway. You and the other guy, you go up, take the Jeep and go over there and get that guy. And so we, we drove through the, through the town and uh, the guy was under guard and what you did, you had your jeep and there was a steel pole, iron pole that went up in front of the jeep and they used that so that when you go down the road, it would clip wires. And so he would sit on the front of the, 
the G by the hood and hold on to that. And of course the order was, if he gets out, shoot him. And then he'll be executed when he gets back. And the sergeant said, well, you guys are going to have to shoot him. <laughs> and I thought, oh my God. You know, uh, the impact of, of having to execute somebody. And so, so they interviewed him, the, the officers interviewed him, and they decided not, not to execute him. And if I had, I had to do that, I don't know what would have happened. Mm. Because that was, it's one thing when people are shooting at you. Mm. Uh, it's another thing when, you know, there's, you send somebody up and just murder them. Mm. Oh, I suppose another experience was I was up in a pole, uh, fixing a wire and, uh, in Bastogne, and all of a sudden mortar shells kept dropping by. And I said, they're aiming at me! And, because they were only about a mile away. And so I came down that pole, pole and I said, I'm not going to be a, a wireman when I grow up, I'll tell you. Now I'm going to go back to school. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, we, we changed our focus a little bit and I became very much involved in rehabilitation work, uh, training rehabilitation counselors and subsequently went up through the ranks at Tech. And, uh, in the 60s, I went into private practice as a psychologist. I see. And I was part-time at tech and part-time at practice, so I was right over here at the hospital. What sort of population were you working with in a private practice? Anything that could be referred to me. Okay. I called myself a psychological general practitioner. I see. And we became very much involved with kids and so on, mm -hmm. children with learning disabilities. Uh, and finally, uh, my friend who was a department chair came and said, come on back to the university and we'll give you tenure and we want you to direct a program. And, but I, I did it on the condition that I could continue in my practice because I had pretty well established here. I was the first psychologist in private practice in Lubbock. Uh, with an office in a medical facility. And I uh, continued, uh, came back to tech and continued with that. And, let's see, I, I quit tech when I was 70, I was 18 years ago. And, but I continued my practice up until oh, four or five years ago, Iris. No, we hadn't moved here. It was before, it's over seven years ago. We stopped. She's a psychologist also. Uh, it was a good career, so I've had a very close career with psychology in a medical setting. Well, and you know, to think of psychology, the change you saw, changes you saw in the field. I could not practice now. No, I could not practice now. It's like the old physician, you know. You know the words and everything, but really the, uh, the, the technology has changed so much. Uh, and the whole focus, what does your wife do? Is she in practice or? She, uh, yeah, she does clinical, she does clinical work, but she, uh, she's not practicing right now, but she'll, she'll start practicing and she's licensed in Texas. Yeah, see I was on a licensing board. I could, uh, some years ago, I could have signed her license for it. <laughs> I was the chairman of the board. Well, when you say uh, you couldn't practice now, what are the things you're thinking of when you say that? Well, the, the techniques, the, the, there's two things. One is the whole emphasis upon uh, billing and so on. We didn't have any of that stuff, the insurance stuff, which is just killing these people on. And uh, the... Uh, other thing is that, that neuropsychology, I was doing some of the original work on that, but it has moved far beyond where I was when I was playing with it. Because one of the guys that I went to 
Chicago with, who was one of the leaders in development of some of these tests, right then. And uh, then the, the cognitive behavioral stuff and, and the old psychotherapy as I knew it. I mean, Freud is out of the business. And we were very influenced by Dreikers, the Adlerian psychology, mm -hmm. and uh, very much so. He even had Rudolf Dreikers down here. Uh, but, I mean, that's, they just don't, it, it, things have changed. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would say this, uh, our daughter, our granddaughter, is a, the, uh, a doctoral student at the University of Colorado mm -hmm. in psychology, but she's not in clinical psychology, <laughs> believe me. She's a research psychologist in what they call cognitive psychology. Uh -huh. uh, and I, her mother and daddy are both psychologists uh, and the old clinical psychologists. And that's not the way to go right now. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think. <laughs> well, it was a wonderful career for you, it sounds like. It was a very good career, and that's why we're here. Yeah. But it's interesting you mentioned earlier, I got, I just caught a hint of it. Um, if you had been working at the psychiatrist with the VA versus going into psychotherapy, how that might have changed. Well, yeah. uh, Probably I would have gotten on medication at that time what they, what they were using, and uh, I could have been a patient at a VA hospital. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, sure. you had one a big one at Waco, you had a big one at Temple, uh, but it, it just would have been different. Mm -hmm. Well, you got to experience the benefits. So. I had I had yeah. the experience with Rogers, yeah. which had a lasting, lifelong effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the medication was Thorazine, wasn't it? Pardon? The medication was Thorazine back then? Yeah. Thorazine is what they were using. Yeah, yeah for it, the VA yeah, shuffle. Effects that were not very good. So it, it, I did it the hard way, but I did it the good way. Mm -hmm. Well, um, there's, there's a lot I could still ask you, but I, I want to be sensitive to your time. Is there, are there some things that We've remembered a couple of stories. There were some things I should have asked you about. Do you think? Can you think that we didn't necessarily cover? Well, not. I think one thing is very interesting. Is that uh, while I was at Tech, uh, we started to uh, get students. Uh, some students wanted to go into the army. And uh, the, the, the deal was if they uh, enlisted in the, in the Army as graduate students, they would be inducted into the Army as, as second or first lieutenants. So I became a consultant to the Army. <laughs> uh, and so I, I spent uh, time uh, and consulting visits to William Beaumont Medical Center. Uh, we, Iris and I have been up to the Pentagon uh, in a visit with the chief psychologist up there and I've been to several, uh, several different army settings. Uh, so here I was, a buck private, and uh, <laughs> now I'm a consultant for the medical corps. <laughs> That was a good experience, and we had, we trained uh, uh, quite a few psychologists who went into the army, and they, and then they, as soon as they got their degrees or as they went into active duty, they became captains. And uh, one guy went all the way up to be the uh, chief of medical of uh, psychological services for the uh, for the army. Well, now I also wanted to ask you because you mentioned it earlier. Uh, Reunions. I know you've been involved in reunions. Yeah. Well, what has that meant for you over the years? Well, I became involved about, oh, 15 
years ago late and to the national group. And then about seven or eight years ago, uh, they had this Western chapter and I met with them and it was a smaller group and of course at a reunion what you do is play I Remember When, you know. And uh, subsequently I went up, we had a re uh, reunion here once in Lubbock, which was the best one they've ever had. Uh, and it, it, it's, been a, it's been a good experience. The group is getting smaller, obviously. And uh, all of us are younger. None of us are officers. We're officers because we were all hellbird. Here I'm 88 and I was, I'm one of the young ones. <laughs> That's a good feeling when you get together uh, to be one of the young yeah. ones. Yeah. And uh, I probably won't continue much longer because they, they're having these reunions out in Phoenix and it's just, I can't drive anymore on the highway. It's just too much. Yeah, it's but it's, it's been very, very good. Yeah. Very good. And by the way, as I said before, the ASTP boys are the ones who've gone up. And <laughs> I think our current president, no, current president is a son of a veteran, but uh, the last few presidents have all been ASTP years. <laughs> uh, that, that to me is interesting. I think it's a tragedy because there was a cream of the crop and then they went and put in infantry and stuff and mowed them all down. Yeah. Oh, they, the, yeah. the, uh, some of the divisions, uh, I, I may not be exactly historically accurate, but one of the divisions that was sent up uh, to man the front lines before the bulge was the 106th Infantry Division, which was composed of a large number of ASDB boys, they did, and they just sent them over there. And that was supposed to be the quiet front. And they put those boys right up there yeah. in December, and that's where the Germans sit. Yeah. And uh, they were they were devastated. Yeah. Yeah. And we had our infantry had high casualties too. Yeah. And so many of, of the uh, lower level people were they were nice bright college boys. Well, Dr. Anderson, I want to thank you for your two things, for your time today and for your service to our country. And I know Robert wants to thank you for that, too. Well, thank you. Yeah. Robert, were there any questions that you wanted to ask? Um, I did want to follow up on the um, ASCP real quick. I wanted to go revisit that. If you could talk a little bit more, we had discussed with another veteran who was not in the ASCP program and he discussed a tension when the ASCP men arrived. Was there any tension in the 10th Armored Division? Well, uh, all our commissioned officers at that time, they, they already had their ranks. And uh, I don't think there was a lot of tension. Hell, we were just cannon fodder. Mm. Uh, and I think there, if anything, there could have been some resentment. We got a bunch of untrained guys, but I didn't feel that tension. And the uh, very few of us went up in rank because we we moved so fast and got into this combat in hell. Uh, they were devastated. Uh, I forget our casualty numbers, but they're, they're pretty good and the wounded and so on. Well, your training was not great. And that, the training was not good. And a lot of these boys going into the infantry units, they weren't trained at all. Yeah. And uh, I resent that. I resent that. And not not the my service as such, but the fact that uh, if you read the history of the ASCP, you'll see that General Marshall and a couple of the others didn't want this program in the first place. And uh, subsequently you went through and then it, it was wiped out, you know, 
Yeah. The March of 1944. Yeah, over yeah. Yeah, you'll find that out from Dr. Hartman, too. Oh, well, thank you, Dr. Anderson. Okay. Sorry, I...